Once everybody stand up, we'll start our two not service off with a praise. <laughs> One, two, three, praise the Lord! Chip. But it's on the card. It ain't on me. I took the card away. Well, 
God, I, I honor when they start saying we got to put a chip in your right hand and in your heart. That's what the Bible says. It's time for us, God, to say, no, no, no. You're, yeah. getting, too, you're getting too personal. It's like somebody say, preacher, you done put preaching in your yeah. head. That's what they do. But anyhow, they say if you work for a certain factory, a uh, certain company, they want all their employees to be uh, implanted with a chip. What if you quit, let's go? That means you can't quit. You got your soul in. I tell you, I, I, I'm not, hey, I'm telling you something, children. I said it before, and I said it several years ago. Brother, the stage is being set in our time. Yes, sir. Yes. Brother Antichrist himself to step yeah. out. Yeah. But according to the Bible, I can preach for you on this. But according to the Bible, <laughs> honey, Second Thessalonians, honey, listen, he can't be revealed. He can't step out on the stage until what? The church is gone. Yeah, yeah. And brother, we're living on the razor blade edge of the rapture of the church. Yeah. If you're working on a public job, you need to go in in the morning and turn in a rapture notice. I know a preacher did that one time. They said, what do you mean you quit us? They had to say they have no sense of saying what's it? He had to stop and explain it to them. So you said, listen, I'm on a rapture notice. If the rapture takes place and Y'all still here? You might want to get you another preacher. Right. I'm going to be poop, be gone. Right. You didn't have to be here tonight. Yes. Lord, trust God, bless your heart and soul. Pray to God. Pray for the man of God as he stands to pray. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. The more you pray for him, and, 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 and that's God to pour it on him, honey, the more God will pour it on him. Yeah. Now, I remember up there at that tent when Brother Ralph was up there. Brother, let me tell you something. I've seen it here. I've seen him get back there in that prayer room. A man to get up and walk out of here and go back there in the front room, get on his knees, and the whole time the preacher's up here behind this book, yeah, honey, he's back there calling on God. Yes. Back there praying the hell off of it. Amen. Praying the devil off of it. Praying that old hypocrite's attitude off of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And uh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus had twelve of them, and one of them was the devil. Yeah. Well, if you got about a hundred, brother, fifty or seventy-five, look out. <laughs> That's the way it is. The old saying in this day and time, it is what it is. Yeah. But in the house, good to be here. All right, let's all stand. And, uh, uh, I think it'd be a good time to take them off, don't you? Hey, Mike, reach down in them pocketbooks now. Get that off and give to the Lord. You can't out give God. I don't tell them I don't love that. Hey, Mike. about 25 or 30 of us. And uh, when he got ready to take up offering, they asked the ushers to come up and take up the offering. Two of them come on up and got the place, said blessing on the offering. Went out there and got it, come back, and they didn't have roses here and all this other stuff on the table. They had a table and two offering plates. And they poured it out on a, on a communion table and counted it. And when they counted it, they said, preacher, we got enough. He said, go get it. <laughs> he, he come back the second time, poured it out, preacher, where he's still shy. Go get it again. 
He said, now, got a lot of going to kill it, didn't she trying to hold that offering back on the Lord? They might have a nice supplies is still in the Bible. But anyhow, he went and got it the third time. He'd come back up and counted it. He said, preacher, we got it. There's actually a certain amount, and they got it. Amen. You know, God says, read you have not, you ask not. And I've learned, bless God, in my years gone by, hey, if you don't ask, you don't get it. But you better be careful what you ask for. Amen. All right, now, we're going to go right on into service. We're not going to try to take up a lot of time. But I want to ask Sister Jackie, she'll come up here tonight. Now, she's a camp meeting singer. Heard We've got several here. But she turned loose and saved my letter. Open your mouth and let her fly. Praise God, though, we appreciate Sister Jackie and her family and her son, his wife and children, and her husband over here on the get piddle. So y'all pray for Jackie. She'll come. She'll be a blessing to
take it with us? No. no. That everything we've got come from God. Of course it is. Yeah. 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 For all that feel hope ain't anchored in the Lord, you all, you had a bad situation. But tonight we have a special treat for you tonight. And uh, you know we all like to have a special treat, don't we? We've all got a little children. You tell a child you got a special treat for him, then brother, he, 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 he or she's gonna get busy. But I want Sister Helen to come up here tonight. Amen. Uh, this is my uh, sister in the Lord, and she's also a prayer warrior. She left. She she got a faith in God. The little thing. Her husband went on to be with the Lord just a few years ago, and uh, she got uh, kind of weak there. But thank God, God regenerated her and got her really going. And thank God, you know, uh, we appreciate her. And she comes down and she pays us a visit. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate Sister Helen. And uh, I just pray that God lets me live to be as young as that sister is. That I could still go on and carry on and work for the Lord. Yeah. And, and tonight, get her a microphone with my brother. We'll get her this one. Thank you, Lord. My brother, Lord, God bless you. Don't use the rhythm. That'd be all right. You want to take on it? You want to take on it? Now, this will be a dedication to everybody in the church tonight. Uh, <laughs> this same, this bless your soul was a servant of the Lord. Throw some of them never even thought about being born. And I tell you how old she is, but she, she, she loves the Lord, and she knows she's going home to be with Jesus. So we all pray for her tonight, and she'll be a blessing to you. Say a word for the Lord, Sister Heather. Before I say, I want to say I praise the Lord for the opportunity to be here with you folks tonight. I love all of you people. But my husband and I, when we first got saved, we just started going to the Shady Grove Baptist Church. And... Uh, He's going to be with the Lord now. He's seen with the angels. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Bless the Lord. Jesus. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Bless the Lord. 
Sister Helen. Hey, Sister Helen, before you get up, you got one more. Uh, some call it heaven, but I call it home. <laughs> Somewhere beyond the grave.
Have you enjoyed being here? Yeah. yeah. I'm telling you, it's been good just to be here and, yeah. and uh, see these folks sing and, and enjoy themselves and us get to enjoy it with them. So yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the visitors that came and uh, those that work hard and getting people here. Thank you for being here and being a part of the service tonight. Take your Bible again, John chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. And uh, we'll start back where we left off yesterday, last night, and I trust God can speak to our hearts together. John chapter number 12. And uh, remember, we are in Bethany, and uh, if you go outside of Jerusalem, and uh, you'll find Bethany. And it's one of the areas that Jesus spent time as he passed through. Three of the closest friends he had on earth was there inside of Bethany. And he spent much time at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And uh, last night I dealt with uh, what took place with Martha as she represented an individual that needs to be present inside of the house yeah. of God in the day that we're living in. And she represented the servant, the worker. The Word of God said she was covered about with much service. And I dealt with the reasons for serving the Lord, time short. Uh, and I tried to show you that last night from what's happening in biblical prophecy and what's taking place around the world. You don't have to understand Jesus is coming again. Yes, he is. And uh, we can rejoice together and we can understand that <laughs> Uh, there'll be a reuniting day. And that's the hope that the church has and that we have uh, that are saved by the grace of God. And then I dealt with the requirements. What have we got to do? We've got to serve Him with all of our heart. We've got to right. devote our time, our treasures, yeah. our talents, everything to Him. Yeah. And then I dealt with the rewards. What's the rewards of us serving God in this day? Lives that you've impacted for the cause of Christ. Yeah. And one day you'll get to see them on the other side knowing yeah. that you impacted their life for, call, uh, for God. And knowing that you had an impact in their life to get to God. And so it makes all the difference in the world. That's the reason that you should want to serve the Lord in yeah. this day we're living in. Yeah. And may that be the desire of every heart, of every life inside of this place tonight that you would comprehend and I would comprehend there's requirements and there's reasons, but all for the rewards of serving God. And uh, it's going to be a greater reward than you can ever imagine to know that you've got something to lay at the feet of Jesus on that crowning day when we get to lay our crowns at the feet of the Son yeah. of God. Yeah. And so tonight, I want to go a step further and we're going to examine another person inside of Bethany that uh, I believe had an influence on the Lord and the Lord definitely did something miraculous in his life. But he represents somebody that needs to be at every church in America and literally around the world. And yeah. that's the witness. Not only do we need workers, but we need witnesses. Yeah. We yeah. need yeah. testifiers yeah. of yeah. what Jesus has done. Just like you were testifying earlier of what the Lord did for you when he saved you and he changed your life, that's a testifier, yeah. that's a witness yeah. uh, of what God's power is and what yeah. he can still do. And we got to have that in this day we're living in. So I trust that God can speak to our hearts tonight through this as we journey to Bethany. One of the things that uh, I meant to share with you last night, uh, inside of Bethany, the only place in the in Jerusalem, the Middle East area that you can find this is inside of Bethany and that's the mustard seed. That's the smallest of all seeds. And they have those mustard trees there inside of Bethany. And uh, I, I may try to bring everybody one tomorrow night and uh, it, it's not even as big as the tip of your fingernail. It's the smallest of all seeds. But Jesus said, if you got faith as the grain of a mustard seed, yeah. you can move mountains. Yeah. And uh, so I, I may bring everybody one tomorrow night from Bethany and uh, let you take that in your Bible just as a reminder of the fact that you need to have that kind of faith. And, uh, and I, I look at that seed and I say, well, Lord, I don't even have that kind of faith. 
And uh, a lot of times we don't, you don't, I don't. But he said, if you've got a faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you can say unto that mountain, be thou removed, and be cast into the sea. Yeah. And uh, so may God increase our faith. Amen. And uh, But that's the only place you can find that little tree is inside of Bethany. And uh, so uh, a lot of things that's in the scriptures, in the word of God, that, that the Lord will teach you and show you uh, from the land. Uh, that just proves to you that your Bible's alive and well. Yes. And uh, this is another one of these situations tonight that I trust God can speak to our hearts. So let's pray, and then we'll begin reading in verse number 1 of John, chapter number 12. Father, I pray for the next few moments, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Lord, may Jesus be magnified. May you be honored. And Lord, I pray that you would be exalted in this place tonight. Lord, let us reflect for just a, a moment or two and be reminded of what you did for us at Calvary, how you changed our life. Lord, let us be reminded. And God, we'll thank you for all that you do. Touch us tonight. Help us tonight. Help your people. Yeah. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Again, we find here three of the closest friends that the Lord had upon this earth. In verse number one, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead. Notice that phrase, which had been dead. And that means if, if he was still dead, it would have said, He's still dead, yeah. but which had been dead, yeah. past tense. Yeah. He's no longer dead, he's alive. Yeah. And here the scripture tells us uh, whom he raised from the dead. Verse number two, and there they made him a supper, and Martha served. That's where she come from last night, the servant, the worker. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him as a witness. <laughs> Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now notice very quickly in John chapter number 11, that gives you the springboard of the three friends of Jesus. One of them was a worker, one of them is the witness, Lazarus, and the other is the worshiper. It takes all three of those individuals inside of the house of God if we're going to thrive and go forward in this day. And as I said last evening about the worker, one position is not more important than the other. It takes all of the family. It yeah. takes all yeah. of the body. It takes every one of us. And there's more. There's some people that are better at the servant part and there's some that's better at the witnessing part. And there's some that's better at the worshiping part. But it takes all of us together to bring glory and honor to the Son of God. And every one of us, no matter what place we find ourselves in, how can we show our love to the Savior? How can we praise Him? How can we magnify Him? By understanding the place that God's placed every one of us in. And may we be one of these three people that are mentioned here in the Word of God. Now notice in verse number 1 of John chapter number 11. And a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now Jesus, in verse number 5, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There again, that's where I reiterate again, they're precious to the Lord. They, he spent much time when he would go through that part of the country. He would always spend time at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So notice in verse number 14, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. The disciples are asking the question, why are we concerned about Lazarus if he, if he is sleeping? 
And Jesus clarifies, he's not sleeping, he is dead. And so now he comes to the place where he leaves uh, the place he is at and he begins that journey down to where Lazarus is inside of Bethany where they had buried him. In those days, they had professional mourners. They had individuals that would come alongside those Jews. And, and literally, they would go with them to the graveyard. Yeah. And, and they would mourn. They ne not necessarily had to be kin to them, but they were just professional mourners that would leave and, and go mourn with a family just to let them understand that they cared for them and they understood their pain yeah. and their sorrow of death and they would go to where they're at. So there's more than just Lazarus family that is represented at this setting. There's a lot of people all over Jerusalem that is there. There's individuals from all over Bethany that is there. And they are there literally mourning the death of this young man by the name of Lazarus. Now notice what happens. In verse number 15, he says to his disciples again, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that she may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then he goes. And, and verse 17, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, can you imagine his body had already been deteriorating for those four days inside of the grave? Verse number 18, now Bethany was near unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now, verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if, if, thou, dis, uh, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But notice verse 22, a very interesting verse. But I know that even now, I know that he's dead, but I know that even now, Whatever, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Yeah. And he, she knew that the power and the authority right, that was in the yeah. life of the Son of God, yeah. that no matter how bad the circumstances look, no matter how difficult the situation may have been, no matter how hopeless it looked, that there was no way out of the despair of what they were facing. She knew that if Jesus had uh, come to him and would come to him, he still had power and authority to do something about the life of their brother laying in the grave. Yeah. And so notice what he said. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. Amen. The word of God just gives us the springboard and the foundation yeah. of the reason you and I can have life and have it more abundantly is because we know the resurrection and the life, the son of the living God. And if we've been redeemed and set free, we know that we have life running through our bones yeah. and through our veins yeah. because of who Jesus is. Now notice what he says, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. And notice what the scripture said. And, and they called Mary, and they come to the place, and as soon as he saw her, and saw Martha, and saw the Jews and the crowd coming together, in verse number, I believe it's verse number 33, and when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. Why? Because he loved them. Yeah. He cared for yeah. them. He had compassion yeah. for them. It broke his heart 
to see them broken hearted. Yeah. It broke his heart to yeah. see them wounded by death and yeah. what had taken place. And this is where Jesus said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse in your Bible, verse 35, yeah. and Jesus wept. Yeah. Why? Because he, was, he felt the pain and the sorrow yeah. and the suffering and the disheartening of those Jews as they were there at the graveside of a friend, a loved one, yeah. a brother that he had loved and cared for. And Jesus looked at them and he said, come and in groaning in himself in verse number 39 Jesus said take away the stone Martha the sister of him that was dead said unto the Lord by this time he stinketh for the for he had been dead four days but well, can I tell you something the Lord is not bothered by four days or five days or six days or one day when the Lord brings resurrection power it doesn't matter what's happening on the inside of that grave because something's about to take place inside of there that's going to give life and give it to them more abundantly in verse 40 and Jesus said unto her said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe thou shouldest see the glory of God then they took the stone away from the the place where the dead was laid and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said father I thank thee that thou hast heard me what was the verse that she quoted and told him earlier Lord I know that yeah. even now whatsoever yeah. you ask of the father it can be so yeah. and he said Lord uh, father I come to you and I pray to you and I'm asking you and verse number 42 and I knew that thou hearest me always but because of these people which stand by the multitudes, the crowd, the visitors, the loved ones, the friends, the family, because of all these that stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. And the scripture said, and he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin and Jesus saith unto them loose him and let him go and many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did believed on him why because they witnessed yeah. the resurrection and the life yeah. when I think about Lazarus I think about there's three places in the scriptures where Jesus demonstrated the resurrection and the life number one was the city of Nain in Luke chapter number 7 I've been there many times and that city's on the outskirts of Jerusalem and, and it's, a, it's way out beyond the city, it's way out of the way, it's a place that you couldn't even hardly find with a GPS map but Jesus made his way to the city of Nain. It, it is a Muslim city to this day and there's not even one Christian alive in that whole entire our city uh, to this day but there's something that still resonates inside of that community every time I've ever been there we've had a service there the presence of the Lord has always met us in the city of Maine why because that was the place he come and touched the Bible the funeral procession of the little mother that her widowed son was laid on the stretcher and he was dead and she was broken hearted and Jesus felt the compassion of that little family and that little lady and she came to where she was at out in the middle of nowhere and left the uh, left the town and the city 
and came because she loved him and loved her enough to show compassion on them. He stopped the buyer. He stopped the funeral procession and he raised that dead boy Amen. from the yes. ground Amen. and from that little stretcher and gave life back to him. And the last part of those verses said, and he gave him back to her mother. That's exactly what happened in Luke chapter number 7. Jesus stopped the buyer, gave life and resurrection power, and spoke life back into that dead boy. All I can say, I've never been around Jesus where something's dead is going to stay dead because he's always going to bring life yeah. and yeah. back to those people that are dead in trespassing sin. Yeah. I think about the city of Capernaum in Mark chapter number 5, miracle after miracle that was done in that passage of Scripture. But there was the, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, and his daughter was nigh unto death, and they had sent word to Jesus, and on his way to Jairus' house, you remember the woman with an issue of blood touched the hem yeah. of his garment. Yeah. And he yeah. said, something happened. Yeah. Dunamis just left me. Power just left me. Virtue just left me. Because she touched the hem of the garment yeah. of the yeah. Son of God. And he stopped and said, who touched me? I'm telling you something tonight. He still has that kind of authority right. and Amen. that kind of power. Yeah. If we just reach out and touch the Savior and touch yeah. the hem of the yeah. Yeah. It's still wonders of wonders what Jesus could do for your life and mine. If I just had the faith to reach out and touch him, just as that woman did. But there as he's on his way, and he's stopped by that little woman right. as she touched the hem of his garment. Then the servant of Jairus comes running and said, Don't bother the master any longer. It's too late. Your daughter's already dead. But Jesus kept walking toward her. And the disciples kept walking toward her. And the throne kept walking toward her. And he goes inside the house of that little teenage daughter that was 16 years of age. And there he gives life back to her. And she walks out of that house a living testimony and a witness yeah, yeah, to the power of the yeah, resurrection of the life. I'm telling you, he still He's got power. He yeah. still has authority. Right. He can still do yeah. what he said he can do. Yeah. He's not dead, but he's alive forevermore. Yeah. And if you've ever met him, you met the resurrection of yeah. yeah. The city of Nain, the city of Capernaum, but now we come to the city of Bethany and we find Lazarus. He's inside of that graveyard and he's sitting there in the condition of Lazarus. You say, what's wrong with him? He's sick and he's nigh unto death. And his, his little sister Mary and Martha, they're bothered and worried about their brother. The doctors can't help him. The nurses can't help him. The physicians can't help him. He is sitting there in despair. Oh, do you remember the night that you were sitting in despair? And nobody could help you. And nobody could do anything for you. But your condition looked like you was dying. And you were hopeless. And there was nothing that could be done for you. But not only do you see his despair, you see him now coming to the place of death and dying. And there he's brought sorrow and separation to his sisters. And they sitting there saying, oh, if Jesus would just have been here, we know our brother would not have died. If Jesus could have just been here, if he could just been passing by, when you got this sick, we know he'd have compassion on you. But you see his death. You see him in despair. But then thirdly, you understand that death brings decay and he starts decaying and that body starts decaying and four days he had been laying in that grave and four days he had been there as the death worms were taking control of the body of Lazarus but something happened when the son of yeah. God came by yeah. something happened do you remember what sin did to you yeah. do you remember 
the place that you was in yeah. when sin started to oh, in your God. life? Do you remember what you were involved in before the Son of God came yeah. by oh. and gave resurrection yeah. oh, in life oh, you? You were helpless. You were hopeless. Well, you were gone. Well, it looked like all hope was well, gone. But hallelujah well, for the well, grace well, of God. Well, hallelujah well, for the mercy well, of God. Well, Lazarus' condition, he was hopeless. He was dead. Four days, no doubt. The smell, the you can smell the smell of death. You can smell the stench of death. Jesus, it didn't bother him. Aren't you glad it didn't bother him the night you smell like death? Aren't you glad it didn't bother him the night you you smell like sin? Aren't you glad it didn't bother the Lord over your condition? He said, show me the place where he's at. Show me the place of where you laid him. Show me the place that I can go to him. Oh, I'm telling you something tonight. Your condition looked like all hope was gone. Your condition looked like the world had given up on you. And the church had given up on you. And family had given up on you. But there was a three-time holy God that hadn't given up on you. He came looking for you. He came seeking after you. And he found you in that place of sin and despair. And he found you decaying in sin. Yeah. And he found you in the stench of yeah. death yeah. and sorrow and degradation. And he came to where you were at. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mary and Martha looked and said, There's no hope, it's doomed. No way any life can ever come again. It looked like that there was no way that that sepulcher could ever have life walk in it again. There's no way that, that there's no there's no hope whatsoever that anything good could ever come about. But you see, not only the condition of Lazarus as he's laying there in that tomb and in that graveyard, but now you hear the call to Lazarus. Yeah. Jesus said, show me the place where you've laid him. Show me that place yeah, where yeah. he's laying in that grave. Show me that place. And they come to that grave and there he says, roll the stone away. Yeah. And now you hear the call and see the call to Lazarus. I believe, number one, it was a personal call that had to come to Lazarus that day. Do you remember the day you were laying in sin? You thought nobody loved you. You thought nobody cared for you. But somebody named Jesus came to where you was at. That person was called your name. And loved on you just like you was. And he called you out of sin, out of bondage, out of death, out of sorrow. And he spoke life back into your bosom. And here you are, a child of the king this Saturday night, because you heard the personal call of the Savior. Personally, he came to that tomb and called his name. He came to where he was at. Hallelujah. Called his name. You say, why did he just call the name Lazarus? Because if in this had come forth, everybody in that graveyard would have come up and started walking toward Jesus. Why? Because he was the resurrection of the life. personally called your name and let you understand he loved you with an everlasting love he gave his life for you he set you free by his marvelous grace he died upon Calvary he got up the third day he's the resurrection and the life and he calls you personally by name he said Lazarus and then it's a penetrating call he said, come forth. Yeah, Don't just stay there. Come forth. Yeah. Yes, that word come forth means there's changing power. Yeah. There's life-giving power. Yeah. Here all of a sudden Lazarus is 
laying in that graveyard and no doubt for four days he stinketh and those decaying worms have been devouring his body but Jesus said, that doesn't bother me. You roll the stone away. Right. Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. That penetration of the word of God and the word of the Lord. Do you remember the hour? Not only did right. he call you, but something started happening on the yeah. recesses yeah. of your soul. Yeah. You were dead in trespass yeah. and sin. Yeah. You couldn't help yourself. Yeah. But praise God, the son of the living God came to where you was at. Yeah. And you felt love. You felt mercy. Yeah. You felt grace. Yeah. You felt the love of God yeah. begin yeah. penetrating your heart. Yeah. And he began to remind you how much he loved you, yeah. what he did for you, how he gave his life for you. And out of nowhere, you said, hey, I'm coming to where he's at. And you got up out of your despair, up yeah. out of your yeah. sin, up out of your bondage, up out of your pain. you free by his personal call a penetrating call but oh it was a powerful call yeah. you say why because he got up they said how could this be and all of those Jews that were sitting there and standing there and mourning over the death of old Lazarus now, here comes Lazarus. He that had been dead for four days. Now, there's a shaking going on inside the grave. And all of a sudden, something starts happening on that bed of despair. And that bed of hopelessness. And Lazarus said, mm, I feel like life's coming back into my body. I feel like something good's about to happen. And he got up off of that graveyard. And out of that graveyard, off of that bed of despair. And he walks out in front of all of them people. And they said, how can this be? It's the power of the resurrection. And there's been people that said, how can this be? Over your life and mine. You thought you were going down the last time. You thought sin had overtaken you. You thought that you were dead in trespassing sin. But the Son of came by with power and with authority and with the strength of God and the mercy of God. And love lifted you. And grace lifted you. And mercy lifted you. And now you're saved. So Walter always said, if you don't enjoy it yourself, you're probably dead. <laughs> the power of that call. He comes out of that grave. Now you not only understand the condition of Lazarus and the call of Lazarus. What about the change of Lazarus. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. When he comes out of that grave, he's alive. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that day when Jesus made you alive? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that hour when Jesus oh took your life from sin and gave you life and give it to you more abundantly? Yeah. You, you see the change of Lazarus. Now you understand the difference that's aware of his life. He's no longer dead, but he's alive. Amen, and he walks out of that grave. And you see the difference now as he walks out. Well, I wish I'd have been there. And, and you see it in your mind's eyes. Jesus just said, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out of that grave and he starts walking toward the Savior. The whole crowd is there in amazement and in wonder. They said, how can this be? Many of the Jews that were present, the scripture said, believed on him because of what they had just yeah. looked right. yeah. The witness of Lazarus, he had been changed. His life is now different from what it was just a few moments ago. 
A few moments ago, he smelled like death. Yeah. A few moments ago, he smelled like sin. A few moments ago, he smelled like decay. A, a few moments ago, his life looked like doom and hopelessness. But now, there's been a big change occur on the inside and on the outside. And when he comes out of that grave, now he's a living being walking beside the Savior. And there he's a witness to that crowd that is watching what just happened. And as he starts walking arm in arm and shoulder to shoulder with the Savior back to the house in Bethany, they can't even comprehend all they can say. He truly is the resurrection yeah, yeah, of life. Yeah. Hey, hey, oh, 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 the life of the of yeah. a living car. This yeah. night, yeah. your yeah. sin, yeah. your despair has been turned around yeah. and the grace of God has abounded in your life yeah. and now you're a witness and a testimony yeah. that God has set yeah. you free. You've been changed by the grace of God. Look at you now. You're sitting on the church pew. Look at you now. You're playing a guitar inside the house of God. Look at you now. What the mercy of God has done for you and I. I'm telling you, I've been changed. I've been changed. I've been changed. I've been changed. Because of the resurrection and the life that has passed by your way. Hallelujah. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. The change that's occurred. There's been a difference. He was given life. The deliverance that happened. He was set free because they said, Lucy, right. and let him go. Yeah, yeah. You remember the day that Jesus said over your life, loose yeah, her, yeah. loose him, loose him and let him go. Yeah. The devil thought he had you. Yeah. The world thought that they had strangled you. The religious crowd said, we've got them now. But Jesus came by and gave life to you and yes. saved you yes. and set yes. you free. Yes. And now there's been a deliverance that's occurred. You can walk out of that despair and out of that doom because you've heard the voice of Jesus. And he came by and he set you free. And now you've been changed and delivered by the mercy of a living yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. And I want you to think for just a moment. Not only the deliverance that comes and the difference that occurs, but the demonstration that appears. Yeah. Lord Jesus is. He's walking. Supposed to be dead. Amen. Now he's Hallelujah. <laughs> Supposed to be eat up with death worms, but now he's walking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't give up. Hope on him. But yeah. Now he's walking. Yeah. Oh, oh, Said that it's an impossibility. <laughs> He'll never live again. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Jesus said, but I am the resurrection and the yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. I'm making him live again. Yeah. Right, he comes out and he starts walking. And as he's walking down the street back to the house of his sisters, yeah. that crowd's in amazement. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. How can this be? Wow. That's an impossibility. But he's walking. Yeah. Supposed to be dead. Yeah. He's living. Supposed to be dead. But now. As they're talking, going back to the house, where do you find in John chapter number 12, he's sitting beside of Jesus right. yeah. at the table right. of Martha that had prepared the meal. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting beside of Jesus. Yeah. And when they would look through the window of the house, they could see his hand bringing that yeah. hot bread to his mouth. Yeah. 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 They could see Lazarus and Jesus as they were talking together, breaking bread together, yeah. Yeah. sitting at the table together as a witness to that whole area. Yeah. I once was dead, but now 
alive. Demonstrating to the whole crowd, I've met the resurrection and the life. And I'm no longer dead. Amen. Two years ago, my boy was 16 years of age. These are biblical stories, but I'll give you a physical story of this day. Two years ago, I was in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was packing food boxes for homeless students with about 70 teenagers from Wilmington, North Carolina. I was there doing the will of God. I was there being a blessing to others, trying to help people along this journey. My son was in Salisbury with my wife and my mother was there and her mother was there. And they were at a team camp for his basketball team. And he was playing basketball. Everything was going good. And the second half comes up. He goes up, pump fakes, goes to the basket. Two guys come down on him and foul him. And he looks back to the bench and all of a sudden he said it started getting blurry and he started wobbling. And he said all of a sudden everything just went black and it's like he slid into home base and he slid into the bench of the coaches and the players. And Jill noticed something was wrong. She was sitting under the basket and another lady was sitting beside of her. And as she's sitting there, she jumps up and notices something's wrong with Henderson. She runs over to his side and tries to pull him over, but because he's so big at dead weight, she couldn't get him. And they started assessing and found out that Henderson had just died on the court floor and went into cardiac arrest. You can imagine the frantic screams of Jill and and the crowd that was there they had three different games going on in the gym this particular day and they stopped all the games and everybody was gathered around the floor where henderson was laying and he, he was laying there on catawba college floor he had no pulse he had no breath he had no heartbeat he had nothing <coughs> and she looks at the crowd and says whatever you do start praying that's my boy his, one of his basketball coaches is a black pastor and she said whatever you do don't leave his side you stay under his head and you pray for him and we're going to pray three things number one that this will be for the glory of God yeah. number two we're going to pray that God will give him his life back yeah. number three we're going to pray that he won't have any faculty problems any mental problems anything wrong with him but it will be for the glory of God Three minutes goes on, and Renata, an uh, off-duty EMT officer, was there inside of the gym, sitting beside Jill that she didn't even know by coincidence, no, by divine appointment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. She runs over there, and they start assessing, finds out for sure that he's in cardiac arrest. My mother had worked at our hospital as respiratory care all of my born days upon this earth. She had been a uh, the manager of respiratory care department there at Roman Hospital. So she leaves grandmother mode, can you imagine that, into hospital mode. And she starts breathing for Henderson while they're doing CPR compressions on him. 100 compressions, they switch out. 100 compressions, they switch out. 100 compressions, they switch out. Still no response, no life, no pulse, no heartbeat, nothing. Him laying there on the court floor. Three minutes, nothing. Four minutes, nothing. Five minutes, nothing. Six minutes, they say after seven minutes, you start losing brain activity. You start losing your faculties. You start, uh, your body's systems start shutting down. Seven minutes, eight minutes, they escort Jill out into the, into the lobby of the college and consoling her that Henderson would never breathe again. I'm a in Asheville doing the will of God huh? eight minutes she goes out 
They are consoling her. Nine minutes, no response. Ten minutes, no response. Eleven minutes, no response. At the eleven minute mark, they go out in the off, into the lobby and get the AED, an external defibrillator, and they waited to eleven minutes to go find it. If you do CPR, you want to find that first. Yeah. Yeah. Call 911, get the defibrillator, put it on, and let it let it access yeah. 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 the patient. But they just had got a brand new one in two weeks prior to this event, and it was still in the office of the college inside the gym. They bring it out there at 11 minutes. They put it on Henderson and said, advise the shock. They stand back, and at the 12-minute mark, it hits him with that electricity, and Henderson, for the first time, goes, <gasps> and takes a breath. He sits up, which is not supposed to be, and the first thing he asked for, he said, where's my mom? <laughs> and they go out in the lobby and they bring Jill in. Yes, Lord. You know, they were, it's doom, it's despair, nothing's happening. No way life's ever be going, going to be given back to Henderson. It's an impossibility. It's too far gone. But God. Amen. Yeah. At 12 minute mark, they bring her back in. He's sitting up inside the gym. He said, Mama, you knew I couldn't quit and I couldn't give up. Amen. Amen. And he hugged Jill. And the rescue workers by that time had just got there. And they put him on a stretcher. And they started wheeling him out. And he raises up and he looks at everybody and says, Thank you for praying. It's going to be okay. Amen. And walks out of the gym on that, or lays on that stretcher and they push him out of the gym. He gets in the ambulance and the first thing he wants to do, he says, He said, Hey, everybody, he said, Let's get together and let's thank Jesus and let's pray about it. <laughs> Number one, they've never seen a patient live that had been out that long. Number two, they'd never seen a patient that did live that wasn't in a comatose state. Number three, if he was in a comatose state, how could he talk to him? Amen. By the time I get to the hospital, in Rowan Hospital, he's sitting there with all of his friends. He's got a cheeseburger in one hand, fries in another, <laughs> and he's sitting there eating french fries and a cheeseburger, taking swigs of sweet tea. And everybody in there is going. <laughs> the doctors come in. Players from other schools come by and said, We heard that Henderson Lentz died and we had to come see it for ourselves. There's no way. And they come in, he's eating a cheeseburger. <laughs> he's eating fries. That's the one. Amen. Walk, get in the ambulance again. They transfer him, transfer him to Presbyterian Hospital, and he goes to the uh, pediatric heart ward. You gotta understand, pediatric heart ward means that you're going to where the children are. And because he was still 16, he had to go to the pediatric heart ward. He gets in there. He's six four. <laughs> <laughs> The bed's not big enough. <laughs> He's hanging out on both sides. And, and they said, we've never had a patient like you, number one, that, that's this big, and number two, that's ever lived to testify of. Amen. Amen. He's a one percentile. And they said, we want to study you. They've done genome testing on him. They've done every test that you can imagine every heart test, everything you can imagine from blood test to heart test to, to brain test to activity test, everything that you can have done on you, he's had done on him over the last two years. And they keep coming back with this same theory. How can this be? It's an impossibility, medically, 
you're not supposed to be here. That black preacher said, today, inside of Catawba College, we watched the resurrection and the life. Yeah, yeah, walked yeah. inside of this gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gave life back to a dead boy laying yeah. on a court floor. Yeah. And the first thing Jesus did is he gave him back to his mother. Yeah. 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 And everywhere he goes, I mean, it's really scary. Everywhere he goes, people just want to touch him. <laughs> Little little ladies just come up and touch him. He said, he said, Mom, Daddy, what are they doing? I said, You was dead, boy. Now you're alive. But he prayed that Sunday before. Lord, give me a testimony that I can be a witness that would be so unusual. That it would get the attention of the people that would never believe otherwise. Yeah. Amen. 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 So every time they get around him, he is living. You know why? Because he came in contact with the resurrection. Yes, it is. Amen. 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 Every person in this building, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you've met the resurrection. Yes. Amen. Amen. And Jesus wants us not only to be a worker at the house of God, but he wants us to be a witness and a testifier. I once was dead. Now I'm alive. Amen. I once was blind, but now I can see. I was in trespassing sin, yeah. but now he set me free. Amen. Amen. I was in bondage and despair and doom, but I've been delivered yeah. by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. And everywhere we go, we ought to be a testimony and a testifier of the mercy yeah. of the living God. Yeah. Yeah. I was preaching in Kingsport, Tennessee, right outside of Kingsport in a little community called Yuma, Virginia. And Pastor Danny Sykes that got saved here at Gospel Baptist years ago. Drug head, drug addict, I mean rough. When you see his picture, he looked I mean, just rough, just the way he looked, his appearance. And people loved him and prayed for him, and he got saved right down here, Gospel Baptist Church, when Pastor Arthur Blackburn was there and was still living, and he got saved. He now is pastor in Oak Glen Baptist Church up in Yuma, Virginia. Been there for years. <coughs> He'd been praying for a man by the name of Pete Barber for 18 years at this time that he would get saved by the grace of God. Pete Barber, when I first met him, had 400 game fighting chickens. All he knew how to do was gamble and fight chickens rough. He had hair down the here on the back side and his beard came down the front side about the same and had both of them wrapped in dreadlocks, if you know what that is. He looked about like Charles Manson, just a rough character. Nobody would have anything to do with him because of how mean he was and what he did, but this pastor took a love and an interest on Pete Barber's life. He said he, met, he was the only man he's ever met that got a D, DUI on a horse. <laughs> he said he's met him at the jail cell, met him in the hospital, and the first time he really met him was he got stabbed in a barroom brawl, and, and they called him to the hospital and thought Pete was going to die. He went up there and prayed with him. Eighteen years he prayed for him. Well, I was preaching at their church, and I, you know how as preachers we make a big statement. Oh, God, we need to pray for the worst man in this community to get saved. The preacher picked me up the next morning and said, I'm going to take you to him. <laughs> and sure enough, we went to the house of Pete Barber. 
I didn't know whether he's going to stab me. I didn't know whether he's going to shoot me. I didn't know what he was going to do just because of the, the appearance, number one, he had, but then just the stories of what Brother Danny had told me of how mean he was. And so we get to his house, and I said, we need to pray that he would be like a Lazarus in this community. Amen. Because everybody knew him. Everybody knew how mean he was. Everybody knew how bad he was. Everybody knew what he was. And what a witness he could be yeah. if Jesus would save him. We went to his house that next day, and I remember it well. He just got off of work. Him and another buddy was sitting at his kitchen table. They had a Budweiser beer in each hand, and they were sitting there drinking, talking about their day. And we knock on the door. He opens the door, lets us in. And we make small talk with him and introduce ourselves. He knew who Danny was, but didn't know me. And so Brother Danny was introducing him. I was an evangelist preaching at the church, and I wanted to come by and see him. So I, we started talking a little bit, and he started telling me about his chickens and his dogs and, you know, what all he did and how he gambled and how he drank and all the stuff he was involved in. And uh, it was about time to leave for church. And I said, boys, I said, if y'all don't mind, I said, can we pray before we leave? And we just want to pray for you. And I got down in between those two guys, and Pete said, I don't care. Do, do whatever you want to do. And I got down in between them two guys, and all I could explain, Brother Bobby, it was like the liquid love of God just came into that room. And, and I put one hand on one shoulder, one on the other shoulder, and you could just feel the love of God. And Amen. Jesus reminded me, that's where I'd have been. If he hadn't have passed by. Amen. Amen. God broke my heart in the middle of those two boys. And I, I started praying for them. That the Lord would save them. The Lord would touch their heart. We got up. And I didn't know whether he was going to get mad at me. I didn't know if he'd stab me, shoot me. If he's going to. I'm little and I didn't like to fight. So I don't know what he's going to do. We get up. And we start walking the door. And said, we got to get to church. They're waiting on us. And old Pete looked at me right in the eye. And he said. Preacher, do you have to leave so soon? And I knew the Holy Ghost just hooked him. Yeah. And just Amen. Got yeah. Amen. I said, yeah, Pete. I said, they're waiting on us at the church. I said, but man, you, you feel free to come with me. We'd love to have you. Oh, no. He said, they, they wouldn't know how to take me at that church. They wouldn't know how to handle me. And I'm, I'm just too dirty. I'm too bad to go to church. I said, Pete, Jesus loves you just like you are. Right. Yeah. Amen. I said, Will, I'll make you a promise. We're going to go back to church and pray for you. We went back to service that night. They didn't sing Amazing Grace. They didn't have a choir sing. For about two and a half hours, we laid on the floor of that church and prayed for Pete Barber that God would save him. Next night, we went to church. Next night, next night. Sunday morning comes, guess who shows up for the first time in his life to a church? Pete Barber. He shows up that Sunday morning and he makes it about halfway through the service and jumps up, him and his wife and his little boy, and runs out the back of the building and goes back home. You say, that's bad. No, God's working on you. Yep. He'd never been around conviction, never been around the Lord, even in the mountains. He told me afterwards, he said, I, I just thought I was going to live, I was going to die, and that's all it was to it. That's just the way it was going to be. And that Sunday afternoon, that pastor and another man in that community <clears throat> had been coveting together for those 18 years to save Pete Barber. And so they went to his house that Sunday afternoon. It was the first race of the year, Daytona, and no doubt Pete had money on the race just because he gambled all the time. And he was sitting there in his living room on the couch, and he was a mountain man, and so he had mountain language to what he was thinking and what he was saying. And Brother Danny knocked on the door, and he opened the door, and he said, he said, well, I'm glad somebody came. He said, it's been like two coon dogs up the tree fighting. He said, somebody's got to give me some relief. He said, what's going on? And Brother Danny 
started talking to him and showing him the word of God <laughs> and the side of his kitchen table where he'd just been drinking a few days before. He got saved. And the Lord changed him. I'd gone home for the weekend to preach at another meeting and I got a phone call and all you could hear on the other end, he just got saved. I didn't have to ask who. I didn't have to ask where. I knew what had just happened. They never made it to service that night on Sunday evening. They said had service at Pete Barber's house. Rejoicing and shouting and praising the Lord. He said, whatever you do, he said, clear your schedule. He said, come back up here tomorrow. And I left and come back up the hill. The first place I went was to Pete's house. Because I wanted to see it for myself. Last time I seen hair down to here. Had dreadlocks down to here. Rough, mean looking fella. I go to knock on the door of his house. And, and he don't come out. I took the horn and all of a sudden... Pete Barber comes down through the woods, breaking every branch he could, coming out. He said, Preacher, I'm saved. What about that? <laughs> he come out with that coffee table by. Come through the trees, come through the woods. He said, I've just been down at my neighbor's house. We'd been fighting a, a few days before. I've done knocked him out a couple of times, but I want to go down there with the word of God and yeah. knock him in the head and tell him yeah. I did not say. Every night, I'd say the first two weeks he got saved, every night, all them people he gambled with, all them people he fought chickens with, all them people he drank with, I mean, one o'clock in the morning, hey, wake up! He got that coffee table Bible. He'd go to that house through the woods, made his pathway through there everywhere he used to gamble, and he'd wake them up and say, I'm going to let you know I'm not the same Pete Barber. I got saved. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. One o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, yeah. shaking that community up. Lazarus had been resurrected. Yeah. Amen. Amen. They had a little store in that community where we'd eat lunch at, and... Um, I mean, I mean, everybody knew him. And they'd come in from everywhere to that store to eat lunch. All them workers in that area, and they'd come there. And the first thing he'd do before he ever get over there and eat his cheeseburger, he got that big Bible. He's going to everybody's table. Hey, let me tell you, I just got saved. I'm going to tell you what Jesus can do for yeah, you. Yeah. I threatened him. I said, Pete, I said, they're going to shut this place down. They shut it down. I said, that's the best place in town to eat. And you made them shut it down because you've got everybody cornered in the restaurant telling them what Jesus did. <laughs> that's been 15 years ago. And every time my truck comes down Yuma Road, he can smell the diesel fuel or something because he'll come find me every time. And he'll say, Preacher! I want to let you know I'm still saved. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still serving Jesus. But he's been one of the greatest witnesses that I've ever met in my life. And Jesus said, to whom that's been forgiven much will love much. The Lord gave him a job at the First Baptist Church and he's the maintenance man. And the pastor, every time I've ever met that pastor at that church, he's told me, he said, he said, Brother Greg, he said, that's the greatest witness of a man I've ever seen in my life. He said, there's not a UPS driver, a FedEx driver, a delivery man, a delivery woman that comes on this property that they don't get cornered by Pete Barber. <laughs> and the first thing he tells them, he says, I was an old chicken fighter. And Jesus saved me and changed yeah. my life. Yeah. What about yeah. you? Do you know him? Amen. He's a witness. Amen. It makes a difference yeah. Yeah. when you got people inside the house of God that love Jesus right. yeah. Right. Yeah. And everywhere they go, they're a witness. Yes, yeah. sir. So not only do we need workers, but we need witnesses. Yeah. Yeah. May God challenge us tonight Amen. that if we met the resurrection in the life, 
we ought to be a witness yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. to what Jesus has done in us. How many would agree <coughs> that you've been saved in this building way back if you know the Lord? Amen. Then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to let others know yeah. what Jesus has done for us. Let's stand all over the building tonight. Thank you so much for being attentive and letting us take the word of God. I trust it's been a blessing. Yes, it has. I've enjoyed myself. I hope you've enjoyed yours. Amen, brother. And uh, but I, I, I never will forget the day, 16 years of age, where Ralph Sexton Jr. was preaching at Back to Bethel Baptist Camp meeting. The Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart. My cousin invited me to go. I grew up in church. I was a member of a little church there in our area. My mom and dad had me in church all my life, but I never was truly saved. I was religious, but I was lost. Sit on a church pew, never had been changed. Went through the mechanics, knew the language, knew the motion, knew all of that, but I never met the master. But that night, the Holy Ghost came and called my name. Amen. Yes. God did a work in my life and changed me for time and for eternity. And because of that change from that day to this, I try to tell people as a witness and a testifier, yes. the greatest friend you could ever meet is Jesus. Yes. He loves you with an everlasting love. Amen. And he gave his life for you. Amen. May we be witnesses to a lost and dying world that need to see Christ inside of us. May I not be a stumbling block. May I not be a hindrance. But may I be a witness. He is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, I pray tonight that the word of God has been a help and a blessing in reminding us where you found us. God, that was us, just like Lazarus in that tomb of despair when you passed by. Lord, you changed our life. You give us life and give it to us more abundantly. Lord, all you've asked us to do is to testify of that very fact and be a witness to our friends, our family, our loved ones, acquaintances that you place in our pathway that hopefully they can see something in us that they would be hungry for and desire after. So Lord, I pray tonight that you would challenge people in this building God that's got a lost friend, a loved one, acquaintance to get a fresh vision and a burden for them. Lord, that they'd be a witness to them, a testifier to them. And then, Lord, I pray if there's one in this building that's never trusted Christ, God, that you went by their little heart tonight and spoke to them and called their name. And you've let them know that they would just come to you. You wouldn't cast them aside but you'd save them and you would change their life. Lord, I pray tonight if that one is here, God, you would speak to me. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed before they give an invitation song together. But there'd be one in the building that would just be honest. Preacher, I'm, I'm saved, but I've got to be honest. I'm not where I need to be with the Lord. And I'd hate to face him the way I'm living. I know I'm a Christian, but I've got to be honest. I'm not where I need to be. The Lord has spoken to me tonight. Would you just lift that hand up anybody anywhere? Thank you. Would there be one in the building that would just be sure that I'm a Christian? And I don't want to die lost. I don't want to die in my sin, but I really believe the Lord is speaking to me tonight. And I want you to pray for me. Would there be one anywhere just lift that hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me tonight. I'm just not sure that I'm saved. Pray for me. Anyone, anywhere, anyone, anywhere, anyone, anywhere. How many would be honest, preacher? I'm saved. I've got friends and family that need Jesus, and I want you to help me pray that I'll be a witness to them. Would you just lift hands up all over this building? Won't you come and gather around this altar? You come and pray for them as they say, you just mind God. Let's be a witness in these days for Jesus Christ.
country church. And I heard a man and his wife singing that song that Jesus used me. And that song stuck with me day and night. When I was working, I could hear that song. When I was at home, I could hear that song. And that was my desire as a young Christian, that Jesus would use me. Lord, don't refuse me, for surely there's a work that I yeah. can do. Amen. And I thank God yeah. the answer my prayer. Amen. Yeah. And I have been a perfect preacher, I've been a perfect Christian, and I don't know too many other things. But I can say one thing, I've tried. I've tried Amen. to serve my Lord. Best I don't have. God's good to us, ain't he? Yes, he is. Amen. I'll yes. tell you, he's been good to this little boy. Yes, sir. And I'll thank you for it tonight. And uh, I've come too far to look back now. Yeah. I know if Jesus don't come, I know the years is catching up. And you know, okay. he may let me live be another 10, 20 years older. But there's one thing about it. He's done let me live four, almost five years beyond the seventy mark. Yeah. If you live past seventy years, you've done live. You're living on grace then, you're sure done. But I thank God he's blessed me in so many ways. And I do want to say tonight, I thank God. Brother yeah, Greg, Lynch. Coming, God sent him this away to preach this revival. Yeah. You know, we're not one to have a revival every three or four weeks or every couple of months. We just have one when God says to have one. Amen. And there's one thing about it. When God opens up the way, we have a great revival. Amen. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if it takes four or five revivals a year to keep a church alive, why don't you just bless God go on that very thing? <laughs> if it takes that many revivals to keep a church alive. I thank God, brother. Listen, when Lazarus come out of that tomb, I come out of that tomb. God saved me, and praise God, there's something inside of me, the Spirit of God, that's alive and well. Yeah. So, I'll pray God bless your heart. And don't forget now, I don't invite nobody out of the church, but if you ain't going to church somewhere tomorrow night, come on and be with us. And let's enjoy the rest of the revival. Can't never tell Jesus might come. Yeah. Not yeah. Yeah. And I do want to say it's good. Good. I, will, I could call everybody that more good. But I want to say, all of you, that's visiting with us tonight, we appreciate it with all of our hearts. Yes. God bless your heart. Yeah. We love you, and we thank you so much for coming. So let's all stand. Find out how many visitors. Remember, how many visitors. what, brother? Find out how many visitors. Can oh, yeah, come. yeah, thank you. How many, how many bought visitors tonight? Yeah. Brother Junior bought visitors. How many bought Junior? Five. 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 Junior bought five. Three. How many, Dean, did you bring? He bought four. I believe we got a race going on, brother. Right? <laughs> All right. How many of who has bought business? Jackie's right. Brother Eric, how many did you buy? Brother Eric bought one. I got two. Jackie brought three. Huh? I got, I got two. Yeah, Jolene, you got two, put it down. Right. All right. I count for Rose. How many you got, brother? No, I count for Rose. Oh, Rose got one. Appreciate <laughs> that, Mike. All right, anybody else bring business? All right, don't forget now tomorrow night. It's a big night. The winner's going to receive a prize off that table back there. And he don't tell you what it's going to be. So I guarantee you, it'll be a blessing. All right, let's all buy our head. Don't forget tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Come early enough to get in the prayer room, brothers. Come early enough to get in the prayer room, sister. And uh, let's get ready to pray. Boy, it ain't been good. Amen. Well, Joe Pruitt, this business for Gracious Heavenly Father, Father, come in Jesus' name, Lord, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for the man of God, Lord. Yes. Lord, thank you for the bread of life. And we come together one more time on this side of eternity. Lord, we put our feet under the table. Oh, Lord, thank you. Go with us. Be with us, Lord. Bring us back that like next appointed time. And I pray, Lord, if there's one here tonight that doesn't know you, I pray that they come to know you so it's everlasting to us. All these things we say and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.